So then, rumour, the Boys Don't Cry project mm. and the realisation of this work, because um, you've been working on this in your mind and in the studio for some years now, haven't yes. you? I had this idea many years ago, just as a spark of an idea, um, but it was only when my producer and I started uh, recording other people's songs in the studio. It developed into, into, into this project. Um, for the first year when I met Steve, we, we didn't record my material, we, we, we just got to know each other and um, recorded songs we loved, listened to music we loved, played records, watched YouTube clips, got excited about things and then we would record things on the spot and because Steve was quite adventurous and, and at the time he would just, um, he had a wonderful playful spirit and so we'd end up sometimes with tracks with strings on and brass on and everything on, um, uh, just songs that we loved. So how did the search begin then? Did, it, did these songs come from your own record collection? Would people recommend with things that you'd heard or, or just, just tugged your heart in some way? How did the selection process begin? Um, they come from different places, like anything, friends sending you music or clips, um, music that I, I had, but mainly from everywhere, you know, from um, different, different people, different situations. I mean, Ronnie Lane, I heard that, that Ronnie Lane song in a cafe. This is the great thing that you're, you're able to shine a light on songs that uh, a lot of people wouldn't necessarily have heard, you know, great writers, but perhaps alternative songs from, mm. from their catalogue to the ones yes. that we, we usually hear on the radio. Yes, like Terry Reid. I mean, that song, when I first heard Brave Awakening, I just, I must have played it a hundred times. And I heard it at somebody's house, you know, a friend's house after dinner. And um, it just came on. The, it just came on the stereo, and I thought, "What on earth is that? That's incredible!" And for the next 48 hours, I was listening to it non-stop. Um, and then I got the album Seed of Memory, and I was amazed by how beautiful it was. And found out that Graham Nash produced it, and you could hear, you know, the Graham Nash influence all all over it, you know. And interestingly, Terry was telling me the story about it, you know, about Graham coming up to him in the street and saying telling him to come to the studio and how it all happened, so it was really cool. Because the fact that uh, these songs come from the era of vinyl, I mean, they would have been on vinyl albums, they would have been in vinyl collections, they would have had the warmth of analog yeah. recording techniques um, and the warmth of the, the vinyl playing system and the big speakers or, or, or yeah. headphones that you know one had in those days so in terms of that sound then from the early 70s rumor the how did you feel about did you want to kind of recreate that sound and and and, and feel the warmth of that sound in your recording process well, I absolutely you know I, I really all I want from a rec recording is warmth um, and, and and beauty and clarity um, yeah I love I love to create a, a warm fuzzy kind of feeling or an atmosphere when you listen to a, a record and Steve and I had created that sound together what I wanted it to feel um, you know like like those old records in, in the, that, that you just bring in these amazing musicians and a lot of it was played together in one room so everyone's recorded everyone's mic'd up and they're playing together and they figure it out between them and then they you know, play it. And the recording process you've just described, because that is quite prevalent in Nashville, with mm. everybody playing more or less live. Yes. You know, you so you know you would rehearse beforehand, wouldn't you? Bring all the songs up to spec mm. before going onto the studio floor. Yes. And then recording as good as from microphone straight to table. Yes. D did you use reel to reel? Well, no, we didn't on this occasion, but we used we were recorded at rack. So there was a lovely, we call it Studio One in Rack, so it was a lovely sound, lovely warm sound. And Helen Atkinson, uh, who was engineering a lot of it, the second part of the, of the record, was magnificent and did a brilliant job. So there's a lovely warmth at Rack and there's a spirit of um, days gone by, you know, and um, all this lovely, all the lovely old mics and the equipment and everything else. So there was a warmth in the room as well as on, on, the, on the record. Yeah. Was it important to you to interpret these songs in your own way and make them different from the originals? I didn't have a conscious plan. I just thought, well, 
Whatever I'm connecting to emotionally, whatever it is that I'm connecting to, it's usually the singer's job for me is to, um, is to tell the story and tell the story um, and, can, and communicate the emotion in the song as best as you can. I just made an emotional impression of it. So I'd say, look, we'd li I'd, I'd bring the song in and Steve would listen to it and I would listen to it and we'd say, oh yeah, that's interesting. And I'd say, well, there's some nice changes in that. I think, you'll, I think we'll, we'll, be able, we'll be able to bring those changes out. And, um, and there's beauty in there. Um, and so we would sit with, with the piano and routine it together. And then we would forget about the original track and, um, and just explore our own um, go on our own little journey with the song or how we remembered it from maybe 10 minutes ago yes. and never ever listen to it again and often we never listen to the original track till maybe long after we'd it's been produced and, and then we would compare it and think oh my goodness it sounds really different so I guess together we were making emotional impressions of the song um, and, telling, and telling the story so I would just take two things out of the songs the story and the emotion and yeah, and try and convey them as best as I could. One night of love beside a stream.